Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Terranova Church. My name is Matt Schwartz. I'm the pastor of worship and operations here at Terranova. And let me say to you, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. So it is the third Sunday of Easter, a time, a wonderful time of the year in the church year where we, we really focus on what it means that Jesus is risen for us, that he has defeated death and sin forever, and he lives and reigns on high. Amen? This morning, uh, we will be focusing on these themes, and throughout the 50 days, um, throughout the season of Easter, we'll be really focusing and centering in on what it means that Jesus is risen. And this morning also, uh, we are going to be doing our State of the Church address. And so if you're newer visiting with us today, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. This actually gives you a wonderful uh, a snapshot into the Lord's faithfulness to our church, where he has brought us this year and where we believe uh, he is leading us together as a people. And so just want to encourage you all to not see this as, as a Sunday of, of information, but of evidence of how God has, has uh, uniquely uh, put his vision on this church, put his love and his presence on these people to become a family that is um, just on fire for Jesus and wanting to proclaim his name and live for him in this area, in this city, in this state, in this country. And so just want to encourage you all as we enter into this time to see this as God's faithfulness to us and what he has done for us. So we're going to start with a call to worship, a responsive call to worship. So would you please stand? And then we're going to lift our voices up together and sing true things about our Lord and Savior Jesus. He is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Let us worship the risen Christ. Yeah. 
about our God together with authority and humility of who he is. Let's read this together as a church. You are God, we praise you. You are the Lord, we acclaim you. You are the eternal Father, all creation worships you. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, Holy Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the holy church acclaims you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all worship, and the Holy Spirit advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you did not shun the virgin's womb. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You are seated at God's right hand in glory. We believe that you will come and be our judge. Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring with your saints to glory everlasting.
should glory save in Christ the Son of God. Him who bought me, Him who bought me, Him who washed me, Him is God. Christ, we trust in your power, we trust in your life, we trust in the mercy and grace that you poured out for us. We trust in your word, we trust in your spirit that guides, and Father, we trust your sovereign plan for us. As we look at the beauty of what you have called into being, which is Terranova Church. And we reflect on what it means to be this holy group of people that are, are sinful, yes, but you have covered us with your blood and you have called us holy. You've called us and made us righteous. And so we are your hands and feet and we are your light in this world and by the power of your Holy Spirit, we want to tell people about your name. We want to proclaim you. We want to sing of you. We want to worship you and praise you. Help us see where you have been faithful to us and where you're taking us and give us faith as a church to continue to proclaim the truth, to continue to love others in Jesus' name and to walk forward as the hands and feet of Jesus, as the people of God with, with a new identity, with a new life, with a new purpose. Help us now Bless Pastor Daniel as he brings us through this message. Let's help us to love Jesus more. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Go ahead may and be have seated. a seat. Yeah. <laughs> and good morning again and welcome. My name is Daniel and I serve as the lead pastor here at Turnover Church. And it's good again to be gathered this morning. And for those of you who couldn't be with us in person but are watching from home, welcome to you as well. Uh, as Pastor Matt said, today is a, a bit of an out-of-the-ordinary Sunday, um, but in a good way, uh, a set-apart Sunday where we actually pause and we take time to reflect together corporately as a family what God has been doing in, in our church and in our lives over this past year plus, um, and then even trying to identify some of those key themes of what he's been doing and impressed on our hearts as important as we look ahead to where he's calling us, the new ground, the fresh ground that he's calling us into. So we'll get into some specifics today, uh, quite a few actually, as to some of those uh, ways that God's been working in our church over the past year, uh, and then looking ahead, even some of the things we have planned. But I, I wanna actually kind of give you a framework for how we'll approach this to get today and then explain why, because I think this can be informative for all of us on a pilgrim level as followers of Jesus. We'll take the first half of our time to spend some time reflecting on this past year and rejoicing. And the second half of our time, uh, we will reorient ourselves in light of what God has been revealing and then look to advance into the future in certain ways that we feel like God is calling us to. Um, but for that first piece, reflecting and rejoicing, this is something I know I don't do enough of and, and probably we as Christians don't do enough of it. It has to be a discipline. Our inclination is to not pause and reflect for most of us anyway. And this is a pattern that we actually see rooted in God himself. And in the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2, 
And what we see there, because God is about to endeavor in a, the creative process in all of the history of the universe and making all that there is, is we see that there is um, a pattern to be followed by God's people as well. And if we're to put it in kind of um, Latin contemporary terms, we could say that the pattern that many have seen there in Genesis as to how God is operating in the creative process is this, contemplation, action, evaluation, and then contemplation again. Now, what does that actually look like in more biblical language in Genesis 1? Well, have you ever wondered what the Spirit was doing hovering above the waters in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? I mean, why didn't it just rush and jump into God creating, speaking, and making things? Well, there's this period of implicit contemplation. God is pondering before he actually begins to make contemplation. But then, of course, by line two, we see that God speaks, and he begins to bring things into existence. He begins to create and make that's action. He's now taking action. He's thought about what it is he wants to do, and now he's taking action. And then at the end of each of those seven days of creation, what does it say? It says that God saw what had been made, and it was good. And so he's evaluating uh, what he has made. Now, it's always going to be good when God is behind it, and so this is a bit of a divergence for us if we're following this pattern. We evaluate in everyday life because sometimes we fall short, sometimes we fail, sometimes we could do things better, sometimes we do things really good, and then we continue in light of that. But God still, he paused at the end of each creative act to evaluate what had been done. But then, even before he begins creating again, he contemplates. It's bookended by contemplation. You see it at the end of every day that there's morning and evening the first day or morning and evening the second day. And especially you see it very clearly at the end of those seven days of creation. God hovered at the beginning contemplating before he created and spoke anything to existence. And then at the end, what does he do? He stops his work and he rests. And he doesn't rest from exhaustion. He rests from satisfaction in what he has made. And so he contemplates it and rejoices in what he has made. He enjoys what he has made. And so you have this pattern of contemplation, action, evaluation, contemplation. Our default tends to be as humans, action, evaluation, action, evaluation, action, evaluation. Okay, what did I do good? What did I not do good? Okay, go back to work. And we skip, we circumvent the contemplation on the front end and the contemplation on the back end. Now, why is that so important? Well, this is in the context of human relationships, contemplation and its importance, but one uh, teacher of the spiritual life had this to say. She said, if we do not contemplate people, we inevitably end up exploiting people. In other words, when we begin a conversation, if we don't first behold that person, really see them, then we end up using them. We think, how can they serve my purposes? But instead, the call here is to hover, Contemplate. Recognize that person's dignity and worth. Contemplate them before you do anything with them. And also then there's contemplation on the back end of the creative process. And this is different than on the front end because it's taking, and it's different than evaluation. What did I do right and wrong? Contemplating that. It's stopping and just celebrating the goodness of what we have done, or in our case, the goodness of what God has done as we reflect back upon this past year, and we just rejoice in that, and we enjoy it. This is, by the way, Sabbath. This is what biblical Sabbath is meant to be, not just, oh, I'm so tired. I need to just sleep the whole day. Well, maybe we get a good nap in. Biblical Sabbath, again, is not resting from exhaustion primarily. It's resting in satisfaction in who God is and in what he has done. Just as God rested from his work in satisfaction at what he'd done. He wasn't exhausted. God can't be exhausted. He was resting in order to enjoy the good work he had done. So, instead of just acting and evaluating and acting and evaluating, we at least once a year corporately take time to pause and reflect and rejoice in what God has done. And we'll do that in a moment. But the second half of what we're going to do with our time is reorient ourselves in light of some key themes that God has been impressing on our congregation and on the leadership, and then exploring what that means for us to move forward in light of those themes. Um, So let me share this verse with you, sometimes kind of misapplied, but Proverbs 29, 18 
says, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Now, probably the more familiar translation for those of you who grew up in the church is the old King James, which says, where there's no vision, the people perish. And it's been used by many an inspirational leader as a basis to rally people behind their big ideas. Well, that's not really the idea of this scripture. Because the kind of vision that's in view here in Proverbs uh, 28, or 29, 18, is prophetic vision. God's revelation to his biblical spokesman. All right? and, and primarily in view here are the Old Testament prophets. What God would do is he would speak to them in light of something the people needed to hear, and then they would speak this prophetic vision over the people, uh, which would reorient them to the truth of the direction that they should be going, and we have much of that recorded in Scripture today, and some of it was not. You know, so there was uh, prophecy by God's prophets that wasn't recorded in Scripture, but much of it is. In the second half of that verse, which says, but blessed is he who keeps the law, there is a parallel concept here that informs what is meant by prophetic vision. Prophetic vision equals the law, and the law equals God's revealed truth in his word. So in other words, it's when people lose sight of God's word that they become unmoored, that they become unanchored. Sometimes that means morally unmoored, where we just begin to drift towards the way that the world does things or towards the pleasures that we're so drawn to that may not be good for us. Sometimes that's just directionally unmoored, um, that without consistent reminders of what's true and important from God's word, we may end up as a church or individually channeling our zeal and our passion in directions that are actually counterproductive, even if we have good intentions in the things that we're doing. And so our application then, there is an appropriate application of Proverbs 29, 18 for today. Though there are no prophets today who are receiving new revelation that's on the par of Scripture, there's a principle here in play, and that is that we need to be constantly reoriented to what is important to God. And there are going to be particular biblical truths and themes that need to be emphasized in different churches and then even within different churches at various points in times in the history of that church, there's going to be different themes that are important, eternally true, but particularly important for where they're at, the culture they're in, or even the particular people and group that God has brought together in that church. So that's what we're going to do in the second half of this message today. We'll consider some key biblical themes that have been significant to our church body over the last year or two, and then consider how we are to proceed in light of these themes. Now, as I mentioned, we'll get into some of the specifics, of course, just highlighting, you know, people and ministries and things God has done here, but um, they will be really to support these high-level themes, and then we encourage you to stick around for the town hall meeting, town hall style meeting, right after church today downstairs around 11 o'clock, uh, where you'll be able to ask questions and engage in conversation more deeply around some of the specifics that come up in the message today. Okay. So first, let's pause, let's consider and reflect and rejoice in some of the things that God has been doing over the last year and even two years or so. Um, first thing that I want to just highlight is some areas of growth that we can rejoice in, um, not the least of which is that over this past year we had three people who were baptized, praise the Lord, and it was, the, it was kind of fun because I think it was the greatest age span that we've ever had with our youngest being 13 and our oldest being 83, who is baptized that Sunday. And so it's always a privilege, especially as God's people in the local church, to witness people testifying to the Lord's salvation of their, in their life and uh, following after him in obedience. Then another form of growth that we encountered is just numerically. We have been growing as a church at the year end of 2022 on a Sunday morning. We were upstairs and down, averaging about 120 people. And then for the first three months or so, the rolling 12-week average, if you will, of 2024, it's been about 140 people. Now, numbers in a church is not the most significant metric um, always, but it is important, right? And some, some of these brand, some of these people who've come over this past year are brand new to the church and are hearing the gospel for the first time. And, and I have specific people in mind. These aren't just generic examples. Others maybe have been inactive for a season or a long spell um, of their life, and God has called them back to re-engage with the body of Christ. Others have moved to the area 
and are new and are uh, to this area and are looking to reestablish themselves with a church family. And it's just been exciting to meet the new people and family, families and faces and get to know you over this past year or so. And here's one of the reasons numeric growth is exciting. It isn't just to celebrate, oh, we're getting bigger as a church. It's because when you have more people, you inevitably have a greater diversity of gifts and of experiences and of resources coming to the table, which brings new opportunities for the building up of the body of Christ and in turn for being a brighter light in the world around us to the communities God's called us. And I didn't ask any of these people for permission, but just to bring this down to a very concrete, practical level, there are a number of ways in which we felt a, a, like a real impact from some of the people who've, who are newer to our community over the last couple of years in both discipleship here and in a heart for mission in our community. I think of the Tapleys, um, of Amy and Alan Tapley, who have just been here for a couple of years. And Amy, I don't know how many times over the past couple of months when Christina Wyman has said, hey, we have a whole entire kids, can you step in? And you just have. And how many kids have been able to hear the gospel and build community together because of people like yourself who've just filled those gaps. And as I'll be talking about later today, we don't want to presume upon that and you forever. And we, there is going to be a call for more people to step in to disciple our kids in our kids' ministry. But that's a blessing. Um, I think of the McKenzie family, who has been here for just a couple of years now, but who has been just incredibly helpful to Matt and a blessing to our congregation in helping with behind the scenes and up front within the worship arts. Um, I think of the Chandlers, who we've, we've known for years, but have, have started to really plug in here at Tara, and even recent conversations with Bethany, just in her heart for mom's ministry and for mission in general, and even for how she's kind of a part of that now. And again, I'll talk a little bit about that later on, um, an initiative for our mom's ministry here. I think of the Gorses, who are another family who I've known for years, um, going back to our Troy days, but have just been here for a couple of years, and we're about ready next week to start a new sermon series in Philippians. And Sarah is a gifted artist. She's also very humble and so probably would not admit to it as much. But it's her artwork that we'll be using as the basis for this sermon series in Philippians. Um, I think of the Conklins um, who have come back in the last couple of years and we have a long history with them. And um, just Erin, uh, who many of you know, who uh, she loves to worship and she loves to praise God with God's people, but she has just been another one who's plugged in and filled holes within our kids program and has been serving our kids. I think particularly in kind of the, uh, the quest age group, right, Matt? Um, kind of the older age group downstairs, but anywhere it's been needed. These are people who are newer to our church family within the last year or two and have just made an impact to the discipleship that, that's happening and, um, and the ripple effect of mission that happens as a result of that. And there are more of you here who I don't have opportunity to speak to, but who are plugging in and are newer to our church family. Numbers make a difference insofar as we are a more vibrant and versatile community uh, seeking to know Christ and make him known together. And I'm thankful for that. Now, to caveat, bigger is not always better. And this is just to get into kind of one of our, um, our, our core values missionally. Um, and we have, as a church, a conviction about planting churches, typically when you get to be a certain size. Um, we were a planted church 12 years ago, and we are involved in helping plant churches elsewhere right now. None that are directly out of, like sending a portion of our congregation. Nothing's on the immediate horizon for that, but that's a part of our heartbeat. And you, you can tell a person or a church's values by where they spend their money, oftentimes, when you kind of look at the, at the budget. And since year one, our conviction has been to set aside 10% of what the family at Terra gives to church planting every year. And in 2023, last year, that was $34,000 from this congregation. And what we do is we actually pool that together with the other two churches across the Terra network. It was about $90,000 we had to invest in church planting um, for the expansion of the gospel and of the kingdom of God. And kind of our rubric for that has been to follow Jesus's um, exhortation of the disciples in Acts 1, where he said, now go to Jerusal Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And for us, that kind of pattern has been a focus upon uh, New York and then New England and then the world and um, 
downstairs in the lobby, you can grab, if you want, one of our 2023 annual reports, and you can see specifically uh, where that money has gone and to what churches. And I just got a text from Mike Mazie, and for some reason, I think it might be you guys are you from a Renovation in Syracuse, um, that said a couple of his church members were going to be here today visiting. And so Renovation is one of those churches, along with a number of, of, of others, and that's just a blessing to be a part of the growth of God's kingdom in that way. And if we ever get to be a church that is bursting beyond the seams of what this uh, physical facility can hold, or God raises up leaders from within, or we have a critical mass of people in this church family from a certain area that we can better reach by planting there, by God's grace, we will. So it's not just about numeric growth in this congregation, but multiplying disciples and churches beyond the walls of this church. Another area of growth we can celebrate is that within our tribes, which are our small groups at Terra Nova, which is the primary place for discipleship and community here at, at our church. And in the last 12 months, we've had two new uh, tribe leaders who've stepped up to, to lead tribes. Uh, the Allen family is one, and uh, the Carpenito family was another family stepped up to lead a tribe. We now have eight tribes in total. It's the most we've ever had uh, since day one. Um, and so we're just thankful for that to meet the needs of a growing church. And, and I just think this is a healthy um, statistic, so I'll share it with you. There are, are about 200 people, reg members and regular attenders, who would call Terra Nova home. Not that many gathering necessarily at once on a Sunday, but that many people who call Terra home. 140 of those are involved in tribes. So that, that's 70% of this congregation is plugged into a tribe, which is really good. Um, and Honestly, for those of you who aren't, a lot of times that extra 30% are people who are newer to our church or um, who aren't quite plugged in yet. But man, this is a call and a challenge and an encouragement to you to engage in a small group community at Terra Nova. Uh, these are the primary place where over the long haul, you're going to grow as a disciple of Christ alongside of other of God's people. Um, now, I will say this, eyes wide open. Now we've been doing this for 12 years and for some of us who've gone back to Terra Troy days, 18 years, the context of tribe community is the highest commitment for community in our church and the hardest, but it's also the context where there's the most opportunity for fruit in the long run. And so if this is something that you're interested in finding out more about, you can reach out to any of the pastors. Um, Amber, our administrative assistant, is the one who kind of gets you plugged into the process of, of finding a tribe. Or you could come to our Nucleus class. We have one in June, on June 23rd where we talk in depth. A nucleus is kind of like a, if you're new here, who are we as a church? And one of the things we'll spend a lot of time talking about is what is tr a tribe community and why might you wanna be a part of one? So please reach out to us if you're interested in engaging at that level of community within our church. And then another area to highlight in the way of growth. Um, I just mentioned Amber Jacoby. She's, I don't know where is she, I think she's been on staff at least for three years, right? At least for three years three or four, but we had the luxury because of the generosity of this congregation and the needs of our church to be able to bring her on in a half time from part time to half time this past year as our administrative assistant. That's given her uh, the flexibility to be, have more of an office presence alongside of Pastor Matt and myself and the others who cycle in and out, out of the office. It's been great to have her working alongside us. She's taken so much off the plates of the pastors as well as others in leadership in our congregation. Um, and we're just so thankful for her. And when I asked her, hey, like, where have you seen growth, even under kind of your role and um, supervision within the church? One of the things that she was delighted to be able to highlight was how we have this really robust uh, Sunday operations team now. Um, you know, not, a, not a, a, sh a shiny platinum type title, operations team. I'll tell you, these, these people, um, we have three of them, um, so Madison Wyman and Josh Carpenito and on occasion Reuben Todd, uh, along with Amber Jacoby, make it happen here on a Sunday morning. Like they are the ones who are behind the scenes, getting here early, make sure things are getting set up, putting out fires, making sure that when electricity or a circuit breaker goes off that that's fixed and AV extraordinaire and basically overseeing the volunteer teams. It's a huge, huge responsibility. And I'll tell you, because my first one of my first volunteer roles 18, 19, 17 years ago in Troy was operations. Like these people absorb so much in the way of making sure 
our worship gathering can happen uninhibited and at the sacrifice oftentimes of their ability to really be fully engaged, um, but also by virtue of having that team of people who've stepped up in that significant way, it's freed up Amber to be able to serve in other ways on a Sunday morning too. So these are the, that's just one example of a behind the scenes area of growth in the way of high level volunteers that you may not even know about or see, but you are a beneficiary and I am a beneficiary of and I'm so thankful for. What are some specific ministries that I can highlight and just we can rejoice in how there's been growth there? Um, one of them would be in, for Poema. Uh, Poema is our women's ministry here at Terranova Church, and this has just been an incredibly active ministry, especially over the past year or two. I think we had about 40 women who attended our fall uh, Poema retreat. There's been that many women who've attended the couple of larger events that we've had since. I mean, that's that's, th those are adult women. That is like a significant percentage of those of you who are here this morning, maybe even more than the number of adult women we have in this room this morning. So it's a really vibrant ministry in which the women of our church are bought in to building community with each other, uh, to being disciples together, to ministering to one another. I'm so thankful for that. In large part, that's a reflection of the women who are helping to lead that team. Um, Jessmine Schwartz and my wife, Leah Williams, and Heather Fekita uh, and Amber Jacoby are all on that team and actually just came back yesterday from a mini retreat where they were just planning, like, what are our values and what is our vision for Point Ama and how do we make sure that this ministry is sustainable and can continue to grow and engage other women in it and continue to have it be a really vibrant part of community life here at Terranova Church. So they've been doing great. Imago has some catching up to do. That's our men's ministry, but I'll tell you, uh, about a month ago, we had um, our, one of our first gatherings in a long time outside of our annual retreat, and it was really well attended, and it was a, a really um, uh, good conversation revolving around a significant theme you'll even hear today, uh, me talk more about the, this idea of a rule of life, and uh, Pastor Matt and Pastor Ruben and I were all just remarking, yeah, we've got to do more of this. Our guys, our guys want this, they're hungry for this, and so we need to create more opportunities for this as well. And then one more ministry to highlight. There's so many things we could, but I just want to take a moment to highlight our, our NAOS ministry, which is our youth ministry here at Terranova Church, which is uh, um, available to those who are about 6th through 12th grade, quite an age span. Um, but they make it work, and there's ways in which the older are able then to disciple the younger. This began in 2022, if I remember correctly, Matt, but really it was last year in 2023 where the traction um, uh, took off, and Matt... Uh, and Jessmine have really done a lot of work investing in our youth here at Terra Nova and this ministry that gathers regularly throughout the years on Thursday nights. And what's happened over this past year is there's been a, a real core of families and kids in that age group um, that's been galvanized and there's been some real relational momentum um, from kids that are kind of in a, a diversity of different circumstances and situations in life. And there's been an ethos in those gatherings of asking hard questions and seeking to answer those together from the scripture, which is just, as you'll hear later today, so important as one of our heartbeats is going to be, how do we disciple and raise up this next generation well um, in a culture in which there's so many values that are antithetical to that of Jesus. And so we're thankful for the growth that's happened in our NAOS ministry. Um, there's areas of spiritual formation specifically I want to highlight and identify that have been key in our growth over the past year. One of them would be just that we spent 12 months in the book of Hebrews through 30 sermons re-examining over and over again this idea that what? Who can say it? The main theme of Hebrews. All right, you were listening. <laughs> I, there was a statistic I heard long ago that said you have to hear something seven times in order for it to really stick, but then last year I actually came across, there's new studies that say it's about 30 times, so there were 30 sermons, and it stuck, apparently. So, hey, vindication of that new statistic. There is nothing more important for us as God's people and as Christians to be convinced of than that Jesus is better. Whether you are facing suffering or hardships of other kinds, or disappointment, or feeling deprived of something, or feeling overwhelmed by life, at the most basic level, being convinced that Jesus is better is what you and I is going to determine what you and I do as we respond to life's biggest trials and temptations. And so that was spiritually formative for us, and hopefully the ripple effect of that will continue on with us as we continue to just declare and herald to ourselves, preach it to ourselves and to others that Jesus is better. 
Another area of spiritual formation that's increasingly become important, this may sound so obvious, prayer. And that's not just come from your leaders, that's come from so many of you in this church, just realizing how much more important than you even thought before, being a people of prayer fully dependent upon the Lord is. Now, I just want to, this was kind of a paradigm shifting way to think about prayer I want to, I want to share with you. Most people, inside or outside the church, could answer uh, the question of what is prayer this way, and it, they would not be incorrect. Prayer is a private or corporate form of communication with God, yes. The problem with that definition, if we leave it there, is it can tend to compartmentalize or isolate times of communicating with God to just various times in our day that seem appropriate for that. Um, I was reading a book recently where it was kind of unpacking and talking about some of the ancient monastic traditions and um, particularly a focus on uh, the Benedictine um, monasteries for whom Paul's words in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 were so integral in what their communities were all about, which is, that's where Paul says that we are to pray without ceasing. And the early Benedictines um, and the Benedictine uh, sects or whatever you would call them today, um, versions of the monastic movement, consider their entire lives really to be an attempt to fulfill pray without ceasing. And this was the definition for me comes out of that movement that was so paradigm shifting, and that is prayer is not just private or corporate communication with God. It's maintaining an unfailing awareness of the divine presence and doing all things with him in mind. So see how different that is? That's what God has created you and me for, that we will know perfectly in eternity, but we even have an opportunity to grow in now. And so the way that we get to that point is we start with those set times and rhythms and patterns for prayer that we establish together personally and corporately. And so we do that on a Sunday with our Sunday liturgy. We have uh, responsive prayers that we read together. Did you know that like when we sing songs, we really are praying? If your heart and mind are engaged in the words that we are declaring to the Lord, those are words of adoration, which is a form of prayer. I've heard it said that when we sing hymns, we are praying twice, such as the power uh, and the beauty and the gift of music God's given us as we also declare these truths about him. Um, some other formal ways in which we've set, set up patterns for us as a church to be praying um, is for other churches on Sundays. We started that last year. We've gotten a little bit away from that, but want to get back to the place where we're just interceding on behalf of other local churches like our own that we're in partnership with, like Renovation Church, um, on Sunday mornings. Um, we had one Sunday last, last year where we gathered together for co corporate prayer, but in small groups here on a Sunday morning, if, if those of you who are here remember that. And we want to do that again this summer. It was just a really great way to more intimately engage in prayer together as a church. Throughout the Lenten season, um, uh, the 40 or so days, right, leading up to uh, Easter, um, we had every Wednesday Lenten prayer, uh, which there was a faithful crew that turned out for that. Um, and then one thing that's become increasingly important to the elders is is to be interceding on behalf of you, our church family. And so we commit to do that almost as regularly as the three of us gather together. And some of you have gotten emails from us reaching out just asking for, hey, what's going on in your life and how can we be praying for you? And if you haven't yet, you call Tara home and you're on our email list, you will be getting uh, that email sometime here in 2024 because we want to be interceding regularly for you, our church family. And so prayer has been and it will increasingly become an important part of uh, spiritual formation here at Terra. And then th there's a value that you've probably seen and heard us talking about of building liturgies, if you will, or habits and patterns that orient us towards Christ and the things that are above. Um, that's a, then an aspect of spiritual formation we've been trying to press into over the past year. Uh, liturgy is just a fancy word for a formula or pattern that we repeat over and over again for the sake of formation. That's really the objective there. It comes out of the conviction of the fact that, and some of the women are in a book study right now, You Are What You Love, The Power of Spiritual Habit, like that we are formed by our habits for good or for bad. And we want to embrace that and recognize that truly all of life is spiritual. So how do we harness all of life towards that end of being spiritually formed in Christ's image together? And so we seek to implement that here on Sundays. Um, you've experienced that seasonally as we've placed 
an increased emphasis upon some of the ancient rhythms of the historic church beyond just Christmas and Easter, right? So Advent season and uh, Epiphany and Ash Wednesday and Lent and other rhythms that have been practiced by the church throughout the millennia. And the benefits of this are twofold. One, it aligns us with what many in the church around the world are focused on and are thinking through and are praying into. Millions of Christians meditating on the same themes during the same times of the year. There's power in that, more than we probably will be fully aware of until we get to eternity. The solidarity of the the big C church together. And also, there's value in liturgy because and, 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 and in the different seasons that we're recognizing because it anchors us in biblical themes and traditions that point us regularly back into the story of God. That's why you heard Pastor Matt this morning even, hey, it's the third Sunday of Easter, right? So it's like, it's not just one day we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, but a whole season where we consider the implications of the resurrection of Jesus and that he was alive for 40 days um, interacting with people before he ascended to heaven. And we want to continue to live in light of his story um, as much or more as our own story and the stories going on around us in this world. A more personal way in which we've really begun to talk about and start to live out this idea of liturgy is in personal rules of life, another term that kind of comes out of the early monastic movements that there's just been a resurgence of recognizing, hey, this, is, this really has biblical value and importance here in shaping and forming Christians. And so briefly defined, a rule of life is really just an intentional set of rhythms and practices aimed at aligning our hearts and minds with Jesus in everyday life. And this is rooted in the conviction, like I said, that all of life is spiritual, so everything we do is forming us in one way or another. And so we want to harness that and be very intentional with the way we live our lives. And I'm going to share more in a bit in terms of how we want to go about that. So we just want to celebrate, pause and celebrate those areas of growth in our people, in our ministries, and in the ways, some of the ways that we're being spiritually formed. And there are so many more ways in which we could. Uh, Many of you have personal stories. Um that you could share even this morning, or maybe at the town hall, just the ways that God has been working in and through your life, even as a part of being a, this, a part of this local church. But I want to shift gears now and talk about, okay, in light of that, and in light of some other key themes that the Lord has laid on our hearts, how do we reorient ourselves, kind of hit a reset button, recalibrate ourselves, and then move forward, advance, in light of these key and important themes. And there are three that I want to share with you this morning, and Again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some specific ways we'll seek to kind of live those out um, in the coming months and years. And those are unity, stability, and the vulnerability of children. Those are universally valued things in Scripture that we can find and confirm are true from the Bible. They are not by any means the only values or things that are true and important for us as Christians. They're just particularly important things that have been on the hearts and minds um, by, of our congregation over the past couple of years. And so what I'll do is I'll just kind of share biblically kind of a basis for each of these and then some of the specific ways we see ourselves moving forward into these things. When it comes to unity, which I'll put at the top of that list, in John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, as he's entering basically the the, the week um, that we just celebrated, Holy Week, just before he died, He prays for the unity of his disciples, of the church. And it's so important that there be a oneness, a unity amongst God's people, that he says that it will be the means by which the world recognizes the evidence that I came from the Father. In other words, that that I am actually divine in who I said I was. Unity will be that marker. To the world, unity is so attractive because it's so different. The world sees a people who have the same mission and are pulling in the same direction despite the fact that they have some differences. Internally, within the church, we experience unity in that way of pulling in the same direction of being mission together. But you know what that flows out of? It flows out of a confidence of knowing these people are ultimately for me, despite our differences. And not at the expense of the truth, but because of the truth. I can be confident these people are for me. We may have differences of opinion on secondary issues, but here's what unifies us. Ultimately, we share the same goal of ultimately seeing Jesus glorified and submitting to God as our king in all things. Man, if that is your heart's impulse, 
I'm passionate and convicted about these things, but ultimately I want to see God glorified and submit to him in all things, no matter what it is that I come into contact with in his word that is true. Man, that'll, that'll galvanize a community for unity any day. It's, that rises above the level of anything else that you could want to plant your stake in. Unity flows out of at least two things, and this is kind of going to become the headings under which I'll talk about ways at Terra moving forward we'll want to press into these. Unity flows out of the ingredients of relational transparency. In other words, true community where we really know each other and are being known, and doctrinal clarity. In other words, being clear about who God has revealed himself to be from the scriptures. Inevitably, in any church, we're going to have differences. Unity, it's important to understand, is not the same thing, though, as uniformity, exactly the same in every way. Unity can exist in diversity, and in fact, I would say that it is when there is a diversity that unity most profoundly evidences something that's transcendent to what is normal to human beings. Unity in the church at its best exists where there's a diversity of race and of culture and of preferences and of experiences and even of secondary doctrines, which, in other words, are those things that historically have been held with an open hand by the church as not essential to make someone a Christian. Still important, but not essential to make someone a Christian. So here's how that can contrast with the world's experience where they encounter differences. Oftentimes, differences in the world are responded to with fear, with the judgment of others, with hyperpolarized culture, with people demonizing one another, with cancel culture, and with all other kinds of over-the-top divisive behavior. Now, I'm not talking about appropriately taking a stand for the truth and love. I'm talking about a divisiveness that strips other human beings of their dignity. And that is rooted in when a world doesn't even seek to understand other people, it's rooted in deep insecurity, it's rooted in feeling threatened by other people's differences, and ultimately it's rooted in pride. And it comes from missing the person in front of you with whom you disagree. That's why there's so much disunity in the world. And so relational transparency is gonna be so important for the church if we're gonna to continue to grow in unity. And that, again, just means truly knowing other people and their stories and truly, truly allowing yourself to be known. When we know other people's stories, we gain the ability to understand why somebody else thinks or feels the way that they do, to actually get in their shoes. And whether you agree with them or not, you come to understand on a different level someone's source of pain, their longings, their fears, their hopes. Now, understanding somebody isn't the same thing or doesn't have to equate to accepting what they believe or what they're doing as true or as good. But what understanding does is it infuses the truth when it does need to be spoken with grace. Because when you learn someone else's story, what often you'll find is that behind that person's choices, behind their feelings, even if they are wrong, are desires that are right that just need to be directed to Jesus as the answer. That's what happens when we get to know each other's stories. It doesn't change what is true, it changes how you see the person in front of you as you speak the truth. The other piece of relational transparency, though, is letting ourselves be truly known by others. Probably even the harder thing. But when we do, what that will yield is humility in at least two forms. First of all, when we let ourselves be known before God, we walk in the light before God and others, it yields a sober judgment of ourselves. When we live transparently before God and others, we live, we end up living with a greater self-awareness to our own strengths and weaknesses and our own sins and shortcomings. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 3, do not consider yourself more highly than you ought to, but with sober judgment. Now there the context is talking about the spiritual gifts which are given to the different members of the body of Christ in the church, all by grace. But there is still a biblical principle in view, and that is that all that we have as God's people, including our salvation, is from him and by his grace. And when we understand that, it breeds humility in us. And then there's a second form of humility that helps when it comes to 
relational transparency and then therefore unity, and that is the impulse to consider others' interests before your own. And the way that's connected to letting yourselves be known is, is this. When you risk walking in the light before Jesus and by extension in the presence of his people, and instead of being rejected as you're living transparently in a confessional life, here's where I'm broken, here's where I'm weak, here's where I have sin, and that's met instead with grace and love, it has the profound effect of producing in you the freedom of self-forgetfulness so that you can consider other people interests more important than your own. The preeminent example of this kind of humility is in Jesus himself in Philippians 2, 1 through 11, where we're told that he didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped or to be clung onto, but instead what he did is he lowered himself from his divinely privileged place with God in the heavens to come to earth to die for us so that we could live with him forever. And so this impulse to consider other people before ourselves comes from knowing we are fully accepted. Now, Jesus didn't have to come to know he was fully accepted by walking the light with his sin. He didn't have any sin. He already had perfect security within the Trinity so that he could perfectly and fully be able to consider other people's interests. We risk a lot when we walk in the light with others. We do. And sometimes it can be painful and it doesn't always go well, but we trust the Lord ultimately with the one who judges us and the one whose gospel is true. And when we are met by grace from others, when we walk in the light, it frees us up to care about other people. So relational transparency, again, is knowing other people's stories, which leads to understanding and letting ourselves be known, which leads to humility. This is the first half of the ingredients for, for what's going to build unity in the church is unique from the world. Um, all of this is to be cultivated in the context of community. So as we reorient ourselves on this important truth of unity, how do we advance in light of it? Okay, this is where we get a little more practical. We've already talked about at Terra how tribes, which are our small groups, are the primary place for discipleship and community and even mission at Terra. And Imago and Poema um, have historically been a critical component of that as well. These have been and probably will continue to be the primary places for this at Terra. But one thing that the pastors have begun to recognize as we've become more diverse and we're 12 years old now is there, there certainly is a place for affinity groups. And by that I just mean um, groups that are comprised of people that have a natural overlap with each other, age or interest or career or gender. And there are multi multiple of these that may form in the future, but one of them, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, was a resurgence of a desire for a mom's group here at Terranova. Uh, we have a lot of um, young families and young moms here. And, um, there was about a half dozen moms craving community that reached out to Christina Wyman recently and just asked her about, hey, is there something like this at Terra or could we get something started? And so uh, Christina and, as I mentioned, Bethany Chandler have been working together to get this off the ground again. And so I'm just saying that now because if you're a mom here at Terra and you're starved for or longing for community um, with other moms, there will be opportunity for this. And um, we you can reach out to Bethany or Christina, uh, Christina Wyman. You can just email her, Christina at turnoverchurch.org. Um, she's our Terra Kids Director, and they'll get the ball rolling with that. They want to gather um, some of these moms who are interested this spring, so pretty soon, ideally, and just kind of have a trial run of, of who, who's a part of that, and in light of that, what is it that this group wants and needs, and then proceed from there. So please um, receive that as your invitation to reach out to either of those women and to find out more um, about that group that will be starting as an opportunity to build community. Sunday Gathered, what we're doing right now, is an opportunity for us to build this relational transparency on some level. Um, and I'll just give you one example of it, in which is this is a value in our mind, even as we plan out what these Sundays are going to be like. Uh, most of you probably have received an email over the last uh, week or two, I can't remember exactly when it was sent out, about our summer sermon series, our favorite verses. And what this is, is it's a collection of the favorite verses of the members and families of our Terra Nova Church family that we're going to preach on. But not just that, we're asking for those who submit responses to actually give a little bit of a background as to why 
those verses have been so formative and shaping in their life or their family's life. And for some of them, we, we would love for them to actually share some of that story just briefly on the front end before the, those messages on those verses are preached. Because we want to be a community that's living relationally transparent and know one another. <clears throat> and then here's one that's a little bit more administrative in nature. But this is to kind of set the table for a push that's going to come in the coming months. There's no way of avoiding technology, even if you want to, if we want to be uh, faithfully following Jesus in this day and age. And honestly, when we leverage it right, it can actually be something that helps us to cultivate community. So um, some of you already have on your phones this thing called the Church Center app. It is a way of being able to be connected in tribes and connected in um, where you're serving in our community but this app, if you don't already have it, and we'll be telling you in the coming weeks and months how you can get on it and how you can utilize it better, is actually a way of cultivating deeper community. It's a way of streamlining community here at Terranova Church. It's a way in which you can see, and a one-stop shop for ways that you can see what is going on on our church calendar. You can actually see our church calendar. You can RSVP to those events right through the Church Center app. You can message one another, especially, I don't even know if you know this, tribe leaders, um, they've built the groups now on the Church Center app so that you can message right within those to each other. Um, and there's other really great things that we'll share more in weeks to come. But one thing specifically it also does, and this comes from a request from many of you, is it actually uh, provides a directory if a church uh, chooses to utilize it. Now, what's a directory? Those of you who grew up in some old school Protestant denomination like myself know exactly what a directory is. It's once every couple of years some professional photographer would come and take you and your family's picture. I mean, if you're lucky once every couple of years, it's probably once a decade and people would be like 10 years younger in the picture than they actually were. And then that, they'd print a book and it would have your basic information, a, a phone number, probably not an email address back then, but so that you can actually get in touch with those people because I don't know how many times somebody comes to me and be like, hey, I just had this conversation with this person or I heard this person has this need or I heard this person has this you know, career that I'm interested in and I would love to learn from them. Like, how can I get in touch with them? And a church directory helps solve that problem because it's everybody's basic information and name in one place. And so we're going to be walking you through how to, to kind of sign up and engage and be a part of that. Just so you know, a couple of quick disclaimers. It is confined to only those who are on our email list, so our regular members and attenders, so it's not like information is available to everyone, and you get to determine what you put in there that you want to be known by the rest of the members of the congregation, as much or as little as you would want. But to come full circle, why are we here? Because this is one small way using technology that we can actually facilitate the process of relational transparency and going deeper in community with each other as a church. Well, in order for relational transparency to build, to yield biblical unity, we also need to be a community that strives for doctrinal clarity. It can't be one or the other. Being clear about what the Bible is clear about when it comes to God, his plan for salvation, and the blueprint for human flourishing is critical if we're going to be truly a unified congregation. Because where doctrinal clarity without relational transparency ends up being cold Phariseeism, relational trans transparency without doctrinal clarity ends up and a lot of tears without any real solutions being offered. Which is what happens when empathy is untethered from the truth. People know that we get them, but we're not really leading them anywhere. So we need to be a, a church that's standing on truth as well and clear about what we believe. And so some of the areas in which we as a church have been uh, feeling compelled to be going deeper and re-solidifying our foundation for doctrinal clarity is one, and just our core values as to who we are as a church and our DNA. Um, the whole network elder retreat, and when I say that, we have three Terranova churches, and once a year we gather together just to kind of fellowship, cross-pollinate, and work together on some certain very high-level things. Each of our churches are fully autonomous, but we work together as a family of churches. And one of the things we're talking about is, do we still share all of these core values in common? Or which ones of these core values and DNAs are top tier? We cannot budge from these if we're gonna be a Terranova church, because they're so critical to what it means to be a follower of Jesus and which ones maybe can fall into the more subjective, secondary type things. The reality is, when we came to the end of that conversation, those core values and many of those key pieces of DNA aren't going to change. It's not like we're questioning high-level doctrines of the Christian faith. It's more of like, you know what? 
periodically any Christian, not to mention any church, needs to revisit these things and not just with lip service say we believe them, but really own why. So we've been doing a lot of that as a church family and we will continue to do that. We had actually planned to do a, a sermon series this fall initially on core values and DNA of a church, but we've actually pushed that off to probably sometime in 2025 just because we realized we want to own and define clearly and really figure out how these things are actually informing the way that we follow Jesus better before we actually preach on this. Um, and then another thing is clarifying secondary issues. Just because we can agree to disagree on certain secondary issues doesn't mean they're not important and that we don't need to wrestle with them together. And so this fall, we plan to have at least one Terra talk. We know that one of the issues right now that many people in our congregation have said, hey, we just want to really understand how are we supposed to talk about and engage on this particular issue, issue with our culture is manhood and womanhood, and particularly gender. And so we're going to have a terror talk where we'll, we'll talk about that this fall. And that's just basically like a family room, a large family living room style conversation with people from our church home, typically after church on a Sunday, about key doctrinal issues, um, oftentimes secondary ones, where there's going to be differences of opinion. And because we have the conviction that ultimately we're unified around glorifying God and submitting in all things to him as king, we're able to have these conversations ultimately humbled before knowing it's him we want to glorify and him we want to end up um, honoring with what's true at the end of the day. So we'll also be sending out a survey to you guys to gather information for what other topics you see as relevant that we can engage in in the Terror Talk setting over the next 12 to 18 months. So be on the lookout for that. A second key theme, and these will be a little shorter, is stability. So we talk about unity, which is fostered by relational transparency and doctrinal clarity. And the second one is stability. Speaking of the need for Christian maturity in Ephesians 4, one of the reasons that Paul gives for why we need to be growing in maturity as Christians in verse 14 is this. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And that is so easy to have happen to us in this culture in which we live. There is so much instability politically, economically, relationally, with broken marriages and families, philosophically, uh, this is not new, but just the, the there's no foundation, no belief in absolute truth, so much instability. And then on top of that, there's this steady stream of values and messaging from our world that are completely antithetical to Christ that we are constantly being bombarded with, shaped by whether we recognize that or not. And sometimes it can be overwhelming to try to think, oh, how do I detect all these lies that may be informing my journey of following after Jesus and who I'm being shaped into? They can be so subtle and we can be living them out unwittingly. But if we are proactively building our lives around the things that are true, good, and beautiful as defined by Scripture, then number one, we'll be better able to detect those lies when we encounter them, and two, we will be able to better ensure that we're being shaped more by Jesus than by the world. So how are we going to do that? Well, I'd alluded to this earlier, but one of those ways is by recognizing the value and power of habits, specifically habits that are informed by scripture and what God calls us to. And one of the ways for us to do that is through building a rule of life personally, as families, and as a community. And that is building and establishing rhythms and practices aimed at aligning our hearts and minds with Jesus in everyday life. We may do this through a sermon series. We're not sure what yet whether it's going to be this fall or sometime in 2025 that unpacks some of these key rhythms like Sabbath rest, going into even deeper um, discussion of that. We did a mini-series this past, uh, I don't know if it was this past year. Yeah, I think it was. Scripture intake, fasting and feasting, prayer, generosity, hospitality, living on mission. We just got finished with a series, uh, you know, um, on evangelism like Jesus, but we want to continue to press into that. And many of these things are often, understandably and rightfully, considered classic spiritual disciplines. But when we consider how all of life is spiritual, there is an opportunity, there's a different paradigm through which we understand what it means to implement these rhythms into our life, not just in compartments, but to see everything that we are doing in life as somehow fitting into these habits that will shape us and form us more into Christ and his image. And then the other thing we plan to do in 2025 is consider how we can start more intentionally building 
some of these rhythms and practices together, starting at the tribe level. So there'll be more information on that to come. As a church family, one of the things we've talked a lot about over the past couple of years is the value and importance of membership, something that we want to kind of hit a reset button on and have a more robust version of. And we haven't done anything with it yet, and some of you are like, man, you were talking about this two years ago. What's going on here? And honestly, it's come out of our conviction that because membership is less about just being a piece of paper and church membership is more about a way of life, uh, that we need to do a better job of really unpacking what this is because Church membership is more implicit than explicit in the Bible and especially the New Testament, but it's the idea of a covenant commitment that we, as God's people, make to one another as members of the body of Christ and a responsibility that we have to one another. And as I mentioned, we're doing so much work now really reestablishing what are our core values, our DNA, what is this thing called a rule of life that's so important and integral to spiritual formation for a Christian that we want to wait until we've actually got some deeply seated momentum in those areas before we then talk about membership. Like, here's what it means to be a member at Terranova Church. So it's still on the horizon. In one way, we can help create stability amongst God's people through that covenant commitment we make to one another. Serving another, uh, one another is another way in which we need uh, to grow in the area of stability, or which will help us to grow and be more stable. Um, while, listen, gathering on a Sunday morning is not the only facet or even the most important facet of community life at Terra, gathering corporately for worship is a significant part of our spiritual formation as Christians, and we can't do it without each other. Um, this is one of the areas of greatest opportunity and areas of need for serving is, is here on a Sunday morning. And so if you're not plugged in yet, we would love for you to be. And I'm just going to briefly run through some of the ways, having talked to Amber Jacoby and Christina Steers, that you can be. We have particular areas right now in the need of greeters. So if you're a hospitable person, we would love to have you greeting people at the door. Sometimes you may answer questions, but you don't have to have all the answers. You just need to know the right person to find. Typically that's Amber or whoever's on for operations that Sunday. We need members for our, our communion team. We need members for our counting team. Some of these are small things, but in order for us to gather and worship together on a Sunday, we need to fill these areas. And if you're not yet plugged in and are looking to be, then reach out to Amber and she'll get you more information. For Terra kids, this is probably our greatest area of need, honestly, on a Sunday morning right now when it comes to volunteers. It's, for whatever reason, always our kids' program, a difficult area to keep staffed. And a lot of that just has to do with constantly changing circumstances for people in life. I know we have a number of people serving in our kids' program that are about to have babies. But I'll just say this. Because I know we actually have a range of just different approaches um, to whether or not kids are going to be involved in Terra Kids program, and we totally respect and even encourage families who are like, hey, I want my kids at a younger age to be up here in the sanctuary just to be a part of family worship together, and that's totally valid. When we do infant dedications together as a church family, one of the things that we ask of you as a congregation is to stand and to make a commitment to come alongside of those families dedicating their children and supporting them in that work of raising them to know and grow in Christ. Terra Kids is a really easy way to do that. Because not only are you handed a basic curriculum in which you get this layup of an opportunity to talk about Jesus with these kids, but it's also a context in which you can get to know them, which serves as a foundation for that relationship with those kids throughout the next decade as you get to walk, walk alongside them in other contexts, church picnics, tribe, after church on a Sunday morning. You're going to get to know them differently and have a different opportunity to invest and speak into their life. We're only looking for a once a month commitment here. So whether your kids are in the Terra Kids program or not, we would love for you to consider serving. We have a need for about nine or 10 people right now in order to truly have our full classrooms open uh, come next fall. And so you can reach out to Christina Wyman at Christina at or if you see her and know her, just reach out to her. But we really have a need there. If, and as you're gonna hear in a moment with the last theme we're gonna get into, our children are really important to us. Investing in that next generation is really important to us. More now than ever when there's such divergent values between our culture and Christ. And so we need to be as intentional as possible to be starting young with our kids, sharing Jesus with them. And I know that's happening at the home, but there's something that happens that's unique when God's people surround that family and also input from their respective angles and experiences in life. And there's just something when like, 
another godly person who's not your mom or dad is like sharing some truth that mom or dad have shared with like you 50 times and you just couldn't hear. So consider the, opp the opportunity to be involved in that way in the kids' lives in this congregation. I'll try to be quick here, but this is important too. And one of the things that's going to be an initiative here in, in 2024 come this fall is um, something called the 11-1 cohort. Because if we're going to be stable as a church, then we need to be continue, continuing to raise up and support leaders. And the 11-1 cohort is basically an initiative to invest and train in those uh, who are already involved in leadership or are aspiring, clearly aspiring to leadership here uh, in the body in various ways at Terra. It's called the 11-1 cohort. It comes from 1 Corinthians 11-1, where Paul says, essentially, follow me as I follow Christ. Because to truly be a leader, we have to be servant leaders. To truly be a leader, we have to humble, be humble enough to recognize our leadership is only worth following if our eyes are fixed on Jesus. And so we've already begun extending some invites uh, to folks, particularly those who are already invested in, in leadership in some way. There's limited space here, but listen, if this sounds something that is interesting to you, like you'd want to be involved with, it's a significant investment, but let us know. We would love to talk with you about that and consider what God's doing in your life and whether this could be a part of your own process of discipleship. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier, um, we're going to be getting into the book of Philippians starting next week, so shifting gears here to talking about um, the role of, of preaching coming up to help us become a more stable church body, church family Christians in the midst of instability, because one of the things Philippians addresses head on is how do we have joy in the midst of our suffering? in the midst of the trials and tribulations that we are going through. And yes, it feels like we probably talk about that a lot at, at Terra, but if there's ever a narrow and deep dive into that, it's Paul's letter to the Philippians um, that we look forward to getting into together. Um, there, there may be no bigger challenge to the Christian faith on a day-to-day -day basis than how to reconcile our suffering with a good and loving and sovereign God. And so if we want to be a people of robust faith, when inevitably trials and suffering is going to happen, this is gonna be a great place for us to spend time as pilgrims together. And then lastly, on stability, it's just a stability of identity, particularly as to what it means to be men and women in today's day and age. This is where Imago and Poema have been important ministries for us in the past, but increasingly so as culture around us faces deep confusion over what it means to be a man and a woman. So we see these uh, ministries, Imago and Poema, not just as spaces for our men and women to gather together, but increasingly we want them to be spaces where we're training or retraining each other on biblically what it means to be men and women. All right, lastly, and I know I'm going long, but this is important. This theme of vulnerability of children um, and contending for children who are vulnerable as a church <clears throat> is one that not only in the last couple of years has become increasingly apparent as an important value and theme and we know it's important to Jesus. But this is one that really, since the inception of Terra Nova, even in our Troy days, has been significant. Um, and, and it's just this, uh, whether that was through foster care or uh, supporting work to end child sex slavery, this has always been something thematically that our church has really wanted to dig into deeply, to make the world a safe and fertile place, as safe and fertile a place as possible for children to be able to flourish. And like as I said, that's something we know is so significant and important to Jesus too. It's worth noting that a sign of our times um, is that when society's health can be um, measured by the flourishing of children um, and we see the lack thereof today, we can deduce from that that a culture is in a state of disrepair. And I think that a society has hit rock bottom when children are completely and most vulnerable. The greater, and I think one of the, the things that informs that is where there's the selfishness is greater amongst a, a culture or a community, the vulnerability of the children becomes greater. And it's no coincidence probably that one of the greatest virtues of our land today is human autonomy. Do what you want, right? The reality is in an unhealthy society, those who should be most protected become most vulnerable. If you think about Israel, when Israel in the Old Testament was at their worst before the exile, what were they doing? What was the straw that broke the camel's back? They were sacrificing their children to Molech. And you can read about that if you want to in Jeremiah 32. Why were they doing that? Because 
they were in desperate straits to get what they wanted and nothing else was working anymore. When a society has hit rock bottom, the most precious thing to us, our children, become the most expendable. Now, today we don't see children sacrificed on altars, but they are often the collateral damage of human selfishness in at least three ways I want to briefly mention. One is abandonment. As a church, we want to be addressing fatherlessness. There's been an epidemic of fatherlessness in, in our culture for quite some time, but especially today. A U.S. Bureau census recently came out and said that one out of every four children live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. 25% of our kids live without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 85% of youth in prison grew up in fatherless homes. And additionally, children without fathers are more likely to divorce or have children outside of wedlock. Why? Because fathers are important. God has designed it that way. There are things God has designed dads to be, providers, protectors, teachers, to image things about God to their children that only they can do, just like there's things that only moms can image to their kids about who God is. So we want to address the epidemic of fatherlessness through the ministries that we're involved with and the discipleship that we're doing in our church. Secondly, abortion. Terra Nova wants to be advocating for the unborn. The most vulnerable human beings in the world are the ones that you cannot see and the ones that you cannot hear. And the humbling thing is, if we really think about it, that was us, that was all of us at one point in time or another. And so we want to advocate for the unborn through the ministries that we're involved with and through the sacredness with which we see and uphold all of life, starting at conception. And then thirdly, abdication. We want to be a people who are about affirming biblical parental responsibility. Within the last couple of decades, there's been this radical swing away from supporting the authority and responsibility of parents to be the ones to guide their children into what's right and wrong versus just letting them figure it out based upon whatever makes them feel happy, which is just such a dangerous path to go down. Jeremiah tells us that the heart is deceitful and desperately sick. Who can know it? The Proverbs tell us there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. They also tell us train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. One example of this, certainly not limited to this, but almost symbolic of this, is the gender confusion that exists amongst children today. And there's a real pressure applied to parents to allow their children to decide their future identities. This despite the fact that there are a number of recent studies that have revealed that around 80% of minors who experience gender confusion grow out of it by adulthood. Now as Christians, we, we would come alongside of 100% of those struggling with gender confusion and point them to the God who knew them and knitted them together, including their biology, in their mother's womb and has a good plan for them. But that statistic should cause anyone great pause when considering the wisdom of allowing children to make decisions according to the way they feel. And again, that's just representative of a cultural value of taking a passive role in shaping our children. This push to let children dictate what's right and good for them may actually seem selfless, but it's just the value of human autonomy passed on to the next generation Right? Just like what I did, what was best for me, you do what's best for you. Which is just an abdication of our parental responsibility. So we want to affirm the good and godly role that parents have in shaping their children, in guiding and in correcting and training them in light of God's revealed will for them in Scripture, even when there's resistance from our kids or from the culture. So what does that look like for us to be involved in contending for our children, and especially for those who are most vulnerable? Well, I already spoke to the importance of our Terra Youth Program, NAOS, and our Terra Kids Program. These are places where we have the opportunity to instill in them a biblical worldview, to talk to them about who God has created them to be and to reinforce that where it may not be outside of the Christian community. This is why also that we want to come, continue to come alongside of organizations and support organizations like Young Lives, subsidiary, like a, a, a sub-ministry of Young Life, which comes alongside of supporting teen moms in their journey of motherhood. Or Care Portal, which many of our tribes are involved with, which seeks to resource families who are in jeopardy of losing their children into the foster care system. 
And we want to continue to grow in this way. We're just playing the hand we're dealt. These are the opportunities that have come along, sometimes from people in our own congregation who've said, hey, here is an inroad for us to be able to have this impact in our culture so that we can reflect the heart of Christ in seeking to address fatherlessness, advocate for the unborn, and affirm the good and godly responsibility of parents to shape their children with biblical values. This is just a flyby. If it didn't feel like one, sorry. But as a flyby of the things God is doing, has done, and we're looking forward to continuing to be a part of as we move ahead in the years to come. Again, come to the town hall to interact with us more in any of these things. It really is a place where you can ask questions. We want to hear your input as a part of the priesthood of believers at Terra Nova. And then, just let me say, on behalf of the elders, listen, it's a privilege to pass through this church. It's a privilege to be um, called to be shepherds of this community, to serve you guys. We're thankful for that. So much of what I've talked about today is just a recognition of what God is already doing corporately through our church, through many of you. These themes have surfaced as important in what God's calling us to. So it's with that in mind that it's appropriate for us to continue in our time of worship and celebrate communion, which just brings us full circle back to this reality that we only have each other and this privilege of being in community together because of the work that Christ did on the cross of suffering, lovingly suffering for us. And we only have the privilege of being his ambassadors together because he has called us into his family to follow in his likeness. So let's pray with these things in mind and pray for God to bless us on the road ahead, hard and good as it will be. Father, thank you for this chance to pause, to celebrate, to reflect. Lord, thank you for all the stories that were not spoken from up front but are evidences personally to people here of your work in their lives. And Lord, would you please just give us clear, clear direction ahead. Underscore these themes and others that we need to live in light of so that you truly would be the one who's glorified. And so we would be confronted with the places that we are being called to submit to you as our king in all things, trusting that it is for our good and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Daniel. We're going to sing this hymn, Standing on the Promises, us moving forward in this year uh, in light of what God has shown us and where he's bringing us. We need to be people that are grounded in the promises of his word to us. So as we come for communion, um, you can come down this row and you'll take the bread and dip it in the cup and be reminded that it's Jesus upon whom we stand. So let's sing this song of praise together. Promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages Let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises That cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God.
on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of found a resting place from guilt my soul is free i trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall plead i need no other argument i need no other And that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This sends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me.
church, as we uh, go today, I'm going to leave you with this uh, scripture from Philippians 2, 5 to 11, and uh, I'm going to pray this, uh, pray this as a prayer over us as we go. Um, make your way downstairs. We have some refreshments and uh, some, some paperwork for you uh, downstairs just to be aware of our uh, church town hall meeting. We would love for you to join us for that. Um, even if this is your first Sunday, we would love to have you there to, to hear deeper uh, the things that God is doing and open it up for a time of questions. Um, just making test, uh, questions or just uh, testimony of how the Lord's been working in your life. So we look forward to that. So let me pray this scripture over us, Philippians 2, 5 to 11 as we go. Have this mind among yourselves. Terranova Church, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen, church. We'll see you downstairs.